Hey everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's webcast, Making Scholarly Content More Interactive, Explore Social Annotation. Sponsored by Hypo Hypothesis and JSTOR and presented by Library Journal. I'm Joshua Bean, webcast manager for Library Journal, and I'm gonna hand things over to the Hypothesis, Hypothesis team in just a moment to get started with the presentation. Uh, but first we have a little bit of housekeeping that I'd like to cover. Uh, so the layout of your screen is completely customizable and you can resize any of the windows and you can move them around. So feel free to adjust them as needed. If you do close any of the windows, you can bring them back up by clicking on the appropriate button uh, down in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to chat with your fellow attendees, we encourage you to do so using the attendee chat window. Uh, but if you have any questions for the presenters uh, during the webcast, you can submit your questions over in the Q&A window and you can drop those in there at any time. And then we will do our best to address them near the end of the webcast. Uh, you'll find a copy of the slide deck along with a, some other resources in the resource list window. And you'll be able to download your continuing education certificate from the certification window after you've met the viewing requirements. If you'd like to share this event on social media, you can do that using the hashtag hashtag edtech, uh, and be sure to tag us at Library Journal. If you have any technical di difficulties during the webinar, you can click on the help widget where you can find the system requirements and the FAQs. With this webinar platform, usually if you're having a problem with the sound or the slides are not updating, something like that, or uh, we are gonna do a screen share uh, during this webinar. So if the screen share doesn't load for you, just refresh your browser page. That's kind of the magic fix-all for uh, issues you might encounter with the platform. Uh, so give that a shot. Uh, if, doesn't, if that doesn't solve your issue, you can send me a message in the Q&A and I'll try to help you troubleshoot your problem. Uh, the webcast is being recorded. So if you miss any part of it, or if you wanna share it with someone that wasn't able to watch it today, the on-demand recording uh, is usually available uh, a few hours after the live broadcast. Um, you can use the same link you used today uh, we'll also send you a reminder email tomorrow with uh, a link to watch the recording. All right. Well, with all that good stuff out of the way, I'm going to hand things over to Joe Ferraro uh, with uh, Hypothesis to uh, to get us going here. So take it away, Joe. Awesome. Thanks so much, Joshua. And hi, everybody. Thanks for taking some time uh, to um, attend this webinar today. We're excited to chat about how you can make scholarly contact, content more interactive with social annotation. Um, and I'm really lucky to be joined by a really esteemed group of colleagues. We've got Alex Humphreys. He's the Vice President of Innovation at Ithaca and JSTOR. Lee Heisel, an Associate Teaching Professor at University of Missouri at St. Louis. Uh, Anna Schmidt, a Music and Performing Arts Librarian at the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, and really happy to have a student perspective on here with Bri Jackson, a student at University of Missouri at St. Louis. So we're super excited to chat about a few things today. Uh, we're going to kick it off with what is social annotation? Everyone knows what annotation is, but this might be a new concept to some of you. So we're going to explain that. Uh, then we're going to talk about how annotating JSTOR material with Hypothesis can really enhance your class discussions and support a lot of different growth and um, spark some interesting conversations within your courses. And then we're going to have a discussion in Q&A with the group. So to kick it off, what is social annotation and how does it work? I think the idea of annotation is something that we're all pretty familiar with, you know, taking notes in the margins of your page, making sure that you are, you know, asking the right questions as you're looking through reading. And it's typically seen as a singular activity. But as we move into the digital worlds, what we find is that less than 30% of all course material that's taught in a class is your traditional textbook. You're working with a variety of different resources, whether it's OER and increasingly resources from the libraries. So things like scholarly articles from folks like JSTOR. And so social annotation allows students and faculty alike to do a few things. First, you can take digital notes in the margins of the page and have interactive highlights and comments with any content that you're working on across your course. This can really provide interactive insights. Imagine being able to see what other students in the class are talking about as they go through the same reading. This is especially important when you think of more difficult scholarly readings. 
social annotation allows students and faculty alike to see and have those conversations directly in the margin of the page and do this collaboratively so that you can really chunk out what could be really difficult types of readings in a way that allows students and faculty alike to share insights and learn together. And this is all done in real time within your institution's learning management system. It gives the opportunity for students to see what others are thinking, especially if you're a student like me that was always in the back row thinking everyone knew something that I didn't. It really sheds the light on the fact that not everybody is on the same page when you cover new concepts, and that's especially true when it comes to scholarly journals and articles. And so we're really excited to talk about not only how this works, but show you how it's worked in practice with some really interesting case studies and stories as we go through. The concept seems really complicated, but it's really simple in practice. Using hypothesis is, simple, is as simple as highlighting any piece of content that is in your learning management system, including your JSTOR articles, and then annotating and having that conversation directly in the margin of the page that's allowing you to discuss. And as a student or a faculty member, you can go back and look at all of your annotations and context and see what you were talking about when with a click of a button. We find this is incredibly helpful and incredibly flexible. When you think about it, it can be peer collaboration. It can be scholarly review. It can also be scientific fact checking or even looking for additional resources to support a theory or hypothesis that you read. And even sharing feedback when you think about certain activities that are done in the classroom. And it can be done over any type of content, whether that's web pages and articles, resources directly from your JSTOR subscription that's provided by your university or college's library, any other PDFs or eBooks and things like video. And we're constantly adding new surfaces that you can cover because there are a variety of new content sor sources always being added to your course. Our goal is really to be a one-stop shop to really collaborate and make students able to be more active, visible, and social with their learning and with their reading, especially when you think of hybrid or high flex courses. But there's a huge application in in-person courses as well. And this can really improve outcomes for a variety of different ways. For faculty, you can keep students engaged, make sure that they're actually doing the reading. And it's also quite a bit more interactive and more fun than your traditional discussion board. You can see directly on the page where students are having trouble, where the most highlights and annotations are held. And then you can find out how you can drill deeper and have more in-depth conversations. For institutions, this is super important for a variety of reasons. We want to show our number one goal is to ensure student success. And if you can identify those pain points and friction points for students, you can make sure that they're able to successfully complete their courses. This can impact your attention rates and your graduation rates, which are super important, especially in today's climate. But it also provides you with data that can help guide your programs and make sure that students are getting the resources that they need and getting the supplemental information they need to back it up. For students, this makes learning a bit more fun, and it's not that different than social media. So they're used to highlighting and commenting and speaking in these threaded conversations. You're taking what they do in the real world every day and on their phones and allowing them to do it right in the classroom environment. We've seen some really great success with Hypothesis integrated in a variety of courses. But one thing that we find is that when Hypothesis is deployed in a course, students don't just read, they read more regularly. A case study that we ran with the University of Texas at Austin in an introductory physics course showed that courses without social annotation saw students interacting with their course material seven days or less over the course of an entire semester. But once you added social annotation, students actually saw the interaction grow by 5x, almost 36 times. So when you think about a 15-week course, that's three or four times a week as opposed to once every other week without the annotation. And what we find is it guides more in-depth conversations. And for this, a physics course, faculty feedback was students were more prepared for the course. They could understand where some of the more challenging concepts were and allowed them to have more in-depth conversations directly in the lecture to support the reading. So when you think about social annotation on scholarly writing, this is a place where it's super important. I mean, scholarly writing is difficult, especially for students who haven't done it before. And I think that when they see that they're learning together, it allows them to really dive deeper and have a stronger understanding of the reading that they're looking at. But it also enables teachers and faculty to scaffold these readings in a way that can chunk the information for the students and help them really handle the metacognitive load more consistently without having to just simply read a 94 page document. It allows students to really develop more more robust reading strategies to tackle some of these heavier documents, and it encourages peers to work, learn, and read together. 
think of it as a virtual reading group where students don't ever have to leave the seat that they're sitting in to have these conversations. And all of these things allow to have more critical thinking and also improve students' writing skills when it comes to scholarly reading scholarly reading and it's really helping utilize resources that are available in almost every school library right now directly in the classroom and so with that i want to hand it over to alex at uh, ithaca and j store who can show you how great it is because once you see it in practice you're going to see exactly what i mean alex thanks joe uh thanks everybody so um uh, I'm just going to jump right into a demo showing how it how it operates. Uh, and as I do that, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how uh, what's happening behind the scenes and why it matters. So let me try to share my uh, window with you. Um, and you should be seeing now, uh, Joe, tell me if you're not. Uh, a uh, th So this is the learning management system. Uh, this is Canvas. And this is just a test instance that we've used to, to test this up. Um, I saw a question in the chat about whether or not hypothesis could work with um, for in the free version. You could do this for the free version. What uh, Joe can speak to more about this, and there may be a more detailed answer in the chat. But basically, the hypothesis uh, paid version integrates with the LMS, and that's the primary. That's that's where the real value is. You can use annotate. Um, using the browser version uh, with your class. It's a little bit more legwork to hook everybody into it, but you can absolutely do that. Um, this is the LMS version though. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start a new assignment. Uh, a lot of people think about JSTOR. So just while I'm, while I'm doing this, JSTOR is a library of millions and millions of journal articles and books, but it's often seen as a research uh, tool, not necessarily for course materials. But those articles and books are very often used in class and can be used in class. And Hypothesis really sort of makes that even more possible and, and valuable when they do, do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to JSTOR. And uh, here's an article on uh, annotation because I like to get meta whenever I can. Um, and what I, and this is the one I want to assign my class. So when I have a particular course, uh, an article, whatever, I go to my class. We'll call this the library journal uh, demo. Um, and I give instructions to my class like, uh, hey, class, everybody make, um, uh, make three annotations on this article. And some, some professors will hear about this a little bit later are more specific, some are more uh, allow their, uh, you know, have very, very specific instru instructions, you know, highlight the thesis, show me the problem statement, et cetera, et cetera. Some are more open-minded like this, or open-ended, I should say. Um, and then you would, uh, so Hypothesis is an installation within the learning management system. So it's an external tool um, that uh, institutions have to set up when they're, when they're customers. So they connect to Hypothesis, and here and now I'm in the hypothesis tool, setting this up, and I'm just going to say I want to assign a JSTOR article to my class. So you'll remember I cut and pasted the URL or cut the URL, so I'll paste it in here. And one of the things that's happening here is I want to just sort of highlight. So one of the challenges that faculty often have when uh, sending re uh, readers uh, and the students to course materials is. Uh, for a resource like JSTOR, where you know a lot of that material is licensed and has to be licensed by the institution, if you just include the link, if the teachers just include the link in the syllabus, uh, very often, especially with um, as students are remote or uh, virtual, they would have to re-authenticate through the library system, and they can get lost along the way. What uh, this integration does is because the learning management system knows where the teacher. Uh, is teaching, and we can connect that institution's uh, holdings with what JSTOR, uh, that institution with what JSTOR has. And so when I click on this link, it ch checks to make sure that this teacher, this institution has access to this article. And if so, I can go ahead and set up this um, assignment and assign it. Um, I'll load this in a new tab. Um, and then when I save and publish that, um, it's all set up, and now my te my students can go ahead and see the uh, annotate the tool within um, the learning management system. So here you'll see there are no new directions and annotations. Um, 
you'll see that I've already made an annotation here. I could make another one just by highlighting um, a little section and uh, annotate uh, another comment about annotation. So I could, as a, fa as a faculty member, as a professor, I could highlight, hey, this is a tricky paragraph, pay attention to this. Uh, or, um, or, or students can do so as well. And in fact, I have a, um, a screen capture uh, that was provided by one of our panelists of a class of, of one of the, uh, of her class's interactions with this one particular article on stuttering, um, which was part of the curriculum. We'll hear from Lee in just a bit, as well as uh, her, one of her students. Um, so you can see the students interacting, you can see them responding to each other all around the specific language of the text. So not just a discussion board talking about themes, but really pinning it all to the language, which can make it much more, um, um, a, a much deeper conversation, and like Joe said, a real, a real, a real engaging book club. Um, the last thing I'll say about uh, this interaction is you'll see that you know there's a little JSTOR in the upper left. All of that usage is being logged. Maybe we lose Alex. Looks like we might have. Let's yeah. give him a moment. And while we wait for Alex to come back, uh, we can hit a few of the questions in the Q&A because I think it's really important to see um, how this really works in action to frame the discussion. And so uh, I guess first question that we'd want to cover is, can Hypothesis only be used with JSTOR? And the answer is no. Uh, Hypothesis covers almost any type of course material that you have directly in your course, whether that's PDFs, web pages. OER, textbooks from providers like Vitalsource. We also do cover different types of video surface, like surfaces like YouTube and Canvas Studio. And we're constantly adding new surfaces and providers. So uh, there was a question in the chat as well uh, about, you know, um, are there integrations with folks like Meganto and other reading list applications? This is something that's always on our roadmap. We wanna be able to cover any type of content that's in your specific course. Our relationship with JSTOR and Ithaca is special as uh, as Wendy noted in the um, chat. I mean, the Ithaca team saw the power of social annotation and wanted to be a part of it. So we launched this with our library collections with Ithaca. They were one of the first to do what they're doing and I'd say they're the gold standard in the space, but we're constantly looking to find different ways to add new content sources to the courses that folks are uh, coming into. And I, am, I am back, Joe. Back I'm now. sorry about that. I don't know when I zipped out. Um, uh, evidently, the gold standard can also have internet connection issues. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be a live event without some kind of hiccup. So uh, you were just you made, uh, annotation in your screen share. Uh, so I was annotating right there. Had you seen, have I shown, mm -hmm. did, I, did I, let me show you the annotation that uh, Lee's class did, which was the one thing that I you may not have seen yet. Um, yeah. Or had you seen that? You were at the usage stats, just wrapping up the annotation. Okay, great. Uh, then I think we're done. I, I, I've already I've already shown um, the picture with Lee. The, the real value is um, it's great because that action, all of the interactions are happening on the JSTOR um, platform and so all that usage gets seen by publishers and authors and live it drives up the cost it drives down the cost per use for libraries and is uh, 
uh, is really valuable. JSTOR wants as much of their material to be used in classes as, as is possible, and this is a way to do that. So with that, I'd love to pivot to hearing a little bit from our panel, uh, Joe, about how they've used uh, JSTOR and Hypothesis together, uh, if, that, if that's Absolutely. okay. Yeah, of course. Great. So why don't we um, we can uh, why don't we bring up uh, Lee and Anna and Bree and I'd love for them to introduce themselves uh, to start off by introducing themselves and we can uh, uh, hear and and maybe uh, uh, introduce yourself and, and say I'd love to hear uh, from each of you uh, about how you've used uh, hypothesis like I know Lee and Anna like what you've assigned in class with it. Um, and how that's gone to be used and Bree, your experiences in, in using it on, as a student. We have three perspectives here as a librarian and a faculty member and a, and a student. I'm eager to hear from each of you. Uh, Lee, why don't you go first? All right, well, I'm Lee Heisel and I am an associate teaching professor at the University of Missouri St. Louis. I have been here for 24 years. Um, and the way that I use Hypothesis and JSTOR in my class, um, well, uh, let me begin. I, I, I used it this semester in my Communication and Diversity and Disability course. Um, this is a special topics area course, so it's a higher level. It was cross-listed with um, graduate level. So I had both uh, junior, senior student, undergraduate students, as well as graduate students in the class. And I had about a 50-50 mix. Um, and so the way that I used it is I used uh, recently published articles on a weekly basis, and I loaded those through Hypothesis using JSTOR, and students were invited to freely annotate. I wanted to keep this a very conversational approach in this uh, regard, and so I did not limit students or place any um, specific expectations on them. Um, I encouraged them to, uh, to, pre to ask their questions, to engage with their classmates in a very conversational tone. Um, I did encourage them to focus on one particular annotation to show me what, how they're learning, uh, to ask any questions, things like that, that, you know, directed toward me. But then I encouraged them to just freely annotate. So this gave them the power to really uh, control the conversation. And it allowed them to draw on the areas of interest to them um, and to really uh, dive deeply into those articles in a way that was comfortable for them and that focused on the areas of interest to them. So it will change class to class. Um, but it really gives them that freedom. Thanks, that's great. Uh, uh, Anna, why don't you go next? Anna, if you're speaking, you may be muted. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, so I'm the Music and Performing Arts Librarian at UW-Milwaukee, and I also regularly teach two classes, one on music research methods for master's students mostly in performance, um, and also a class on music librarianship in our um, information studies program. So I've used, uh, I've used Hypothesis in both courses. One is fully online and one is hybrid. Um, so I find it really helps in my hybrid class where um, my students are, come from really varied backgrounds in terms of where they did their undergraduate um, education before coming to a graduate program in music performance. Um, and it helps me really make the most of that time we do have in person in the hybrid course because I can use it as a sort of just-in-time assessment where I can see what they've read, what they've understood right before class. Um, and then focus mm -hmm. in on areas of misunderstanding or where of just particular mm -hmm. interest. Um, and because both my classes are about research and libraries, um, there's also kind of a meta aspect to it where I actually talk about the hypothesis and JSTOR, and we have a we have a whole day where we just talk about JSTOR and RILM, which is a music uh, bibliographic EBSCOhost database. Um, 
and other options that students have for doing music research. Um, so it kind of fits into the the content of the course as well as being sort of um, a tool for improving our, our conversations. Thanks, there was a lot there that I wanna come back to, but I wanna give Bree a chance to introduce himself as well. Uh, uh, Bree, tell us about yourself and your experience with Hypothesis in Lee's class, I should say. Yeah, um, uh, thank you for having me here. I've uh, made most of my life, uh, most of my life, I've been a motivational speaker, and uh, during the pandemic, I decided to go back to school to finish my bachelor's degree, and I'm pursuing a degree in organizational leadership with an emphasis in accessibility design and uh, double minor in communications and sociology. That may change here soon into a full communications degree and go to school to be a graduate student for communication. Um, but I, I'm here because we use... Um, hypothesis in our, uh, in two of my classes um, throughout my uh, career at AMSO, if you would say. And um, I, I I like the aspect of the, the, the social, uh, the socialness of it. Um, normally in other classes, when we have weekly discussion board posts, um, you kind of have to go and read and then you kind of have to go back to that page and then, you know, type what you're talking about. You can lose a little bit of context. And, you know, when you, uh, the, the thing is about the world is there's 6 billion different views, right? And we can all be reading the same article, but get different opinions, different views, and everything's coming to the surface here. Um, but what I like about hypothesis is, is it, it gives us a, a steady place to say, hey, this is what we're talking about. Here's all the context. Talk about it among yourselves. And um, it gives you a great place to actually see like, oh yeah, you know, it's in this paragraph or this, oh, I see, you know. And really uh, what I love about it personally is it gives an opportunity to not only interact with my classmates, but also gives me the opportunity to challenge my classmates thinking and stuff, you know, and normally when you uh you know kind of go back and forth between that discussion board post you kind of get this exhaustion that's like ah i don't even want to i just want to type something by then but when you're on the article or you're on whatever you're going through with your classmates everything's there and it, it's very organized to actually um, have a conversation about that and then i also personally like the other features that my classmates can't see but I can go through the article myself or whatever the posting is, and I can, you know, an, uh, personally annotate something. And maybe I want to revisit that later. Maybe I want to sit on it or, you know, you know, think a little bit. Do I really want to post this? Do I not want to post this? You know, and um, but overall, we used it in the diverse uh, disabilities and communications class. And, um, you know, disabilities is a um, it's, there's no one size fits all. And so the fact that we got to, you know, have articles and, you know, websites and things from different avenues um, and different walks of life, that was really great rather than just reading from a textbook and just textbook and reading that one person's opinion. And, you know, so that's, that's my experience. Hopefully that, you know, it's good for you. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's super helpful. I, I you touched on something that I heard uh, Lee talk about as well, uh, which was um, just the interactions between the students uh, in the class. And Lee, you you, you described um, wanting to set up, you know, this class with uh, um, with but has very different levels. It's got undergraduates and graduates, and that um, there are things that. Um, uh, that they can learn from each other as the, around the around the document, and uh, um, they uh, and and so I'm, I'm interested, Lee, and maybe you, Bree, you can talk about this as well. Like how having this discussion um, and having read this before, like how it changes the class time. How does it change what what happens in your classroom and the interactions you have with your classmates? 
Well, um, in my case, um, as the instructor, I find that when compared to a typical class time that meets one hour, uh, three days a week, that type of a thing versus the virtual classroom, um, that my students in that one class in that uh, where we meet one hour, you know, three times a week, um, I don't have 100% of their focus all the time. So there, as we're talking about things, I realize that there are all kinds of distractions that are occurring. And there's, you know, there's internal distractions as well as external distractions. So they're not necessarily catching every single thing that we're discussing in the class. So um, whenever they are able to annotate, then they have complete focus because they are, they are annotating at a time that is right for them. They have the time to set aside and their focus is there. So a student in a class who let's say is not a morning student, but that is when the class is being, I may not have hundred percent of their attention. Whereas if they can log in and annotate after dinner, which is their prime time, then I know that, that they are interacting in a time that is perfect for them. And so they're more likely to pick up details and to uh, maintain their focus in a way that I can't have in the morning with that particular student. So by letting them annotate um, or encouraging them to annotate, um, I've got their focus on the details. All right. So anything that is confusing to them, they can make a note right there at that moment. And that really helps to identify their points of confusion for me um, or points of interest. Um, there's also the opportunity to add additional information. So you can add a video or you can add another article or something that will help to um, clear up confusion or add to that conversation. So for example, uh, last semester, a student had mentioned um, a, a, a art, a, a, an artist who does work um, that has a particular disability that we were talking about. And Bri went and found an example of that artist's artwork and added it to the article where the student had referenced it. So it was like an immediate where you could not do that in a classroom easily unless a student held up a phone and said, hey, look, I found the art. Um, it's right there. So students who came in later and read through had that same experience as if they were seeing it at the same time as the other students were. So I love that that ability to maintain that discussion, almost like it's in real time, even though it's not, and it's tied directly into the material. Um, so we're looking at it, even if we're not looking at it at the same time, we're looking at it at a similar time. Yeah. Yeah, it sort of extends the class discussion outside of the class yes, time. And exactly. you make a great point that not everybody is gonna be at their best you know, at the time yes. of the class. So it gives time for that asynchronous thing. And I suspect that there are people who need to process differently and exactly. uh, it, it allows people for with all different uh, ways of processing information to, to interact. There, there's a really interesting question um, uh, in the in the Q&A about um, making sure that students annotations uh, have substance. And mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm wondering, uh, maybe Anna, if you could take a take a run at this, like, have you had what kinds of substance and, and uh, value or perspectives do do your t students bring to the to the annotations? Do you have, you know, expectations for them around a certain amount of scholarly rigor or deep insight? Or how does that play out in the uh, in the annotations? Yeah, so I always set it up with um at the beginning of the semester when we first talk about uh, that we're going to be using this this integration, I give them a list of like the types of things I would like to see in annotations. They have an idea of the um, of the direction and just some sort of uh, starting points. I don't usually make have very strict expectations because the levels of my students and their backgrounds coming into things are so varied and their um, language abilities. So a lot of music graduate students um, our international students. And so there's a, a lot of variety in, um, language ability. 
So I usually just use um, individual feedback to say like, okay, this is okay this week, but next week I'd like to see you do a little bit more, but sort of tailored to the, the capacity of an individual mm -hmm. student. Um, another thing you can do is create rubrics, like we use Canvas. I saw somebody else talking about the speed grader in Canvas. Um, and you can set up a rubric in ca Canvas that students can see that says like, this is what gets you five points or, or, you know, or however you wanna um, give that feedback. So that's also a sort of a, mm -hmm. a strategy. Um, so I've seen students do anything from just defining terms, things sometimes I wouldn't have um, thought to define for them because I thought you know, it didn't occur to me that they wouldn't um, have come in with that. Um, in my library, uh, music librarianship class, I get a lot of students bringing in their personal experience. Um, since I have some students with maybe public library experience and others with academic um, or uh, orchestral libraries, they'll sort of comment about uh, work experiences or connections to other classes and things like that, as well as the kind of more um, academic responses to the article. So I usually leave it fairly open, but try to encourage um, more substance by giving individual feedback throughout the semester. We use it every week in both of my classes. So there's lots of chance mm -hmm. to say, this is what I'd like you to do next week. Yeah. Is there a social component where, because it's public and they can see their their fellow students, are there, is there some positive peer pressure or um, does that hold them back? Like, how does that social interaction work? I think there's positive peer pressure, especially in the music librarianship class, um, where uh, it's a pretty small cohort. Um, a number of mm -hmm. students are in our dual degree musicology and librarianship masters. They're getting both masters at once. Um, and so they already have sort of a social um, sort of uh, relationship with each other. In my, I do think that one possible downside in my music research methods course is that um, some students are so much better prepared than others that it can be intimidating yeah. sometimes, I think, when they see what other students are able to bring to it and, and feel kind of overwhelmed by reading scholarly work. But we try to build in sure. support for building that skill so that hopefully, you know, by the end of the semester, they're learning from me and from their more prepared colleagues um, what it looks like to read an academic article. Yeah, I, I wonder, uh, Bree, if maybe you could comment on that. I mean, you you were a grad student in a class with undergraduates. What was your experience interacting with uh, other with your fellow students? Were you able to help them out in um, if you if you feel like you you have have more experience reading academic literature? What did that look like for you? Um, for sure. I mean, there's uh, certain weeks that we had very easy literature, and there was uh, some weeks that we had very uh, you know, tough, like hefty, meaty literature that's like really hard to understand. And I could see that some students, um, you know, especially students who uh, are kind of just getting back into the classroom or maybe don't have that experience of, you know, reading scholarly articles. As somebody with a disability, unfortunately, I've been reading medical journals <laughs> all my life uh, to kind of get down to you know, uh, how to talk to doctors about, you know, what's going on. But um, so I had that experience even before going to school. But, you know, some people just quite aren't there yet. And so it's kind of helping, you know, be in the conversation starter. So getting in there early uh, to kind of review it. And then maybe there's some things that you might find confusing. And so you go and research those for your other classmates, you know. And, you know, there's that uh, challenging piece of like when somebody's not understanding or maybe they, you feel like they took that, you know, the wrong way, uh, you can kind of go in there and have like a, a, a conversation with them, you know, or say, hey, could you think about it this way? Or, hey, I challenge that. Um, so there's definitely that uh, community piece and definitely an opportunity for more advanced students or advanced learners um, to come alongside maybe um, the, the, the peers that just need a little bit more help or um, don't have that familiar, uh, you know, familiarness of, you know, what these articles are. So, 
you can take that wide range and then people just, you know, kind of fit in there. And um, I've kind of found myself being more of a of an encourager. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of my students learn and the ones that I didn't feel were like learning or kind of really um, challenge themselves with the material. I would obviously, you know, nicely call them out. Uh, but the ones who I felt like were becoming champions of, you know, being ambassadors for people with disabilities um, and my disabilities communications path, those were the people who I was like, oh, man, like, you're right on. You're good. You're good. So there's definitely a, a, a place on each of these uh, on hypotheses for the variety of range of students. And you can definitely challenge those uh, upperclassmen or the more experienced ones to go in and really work alongside the ones who, yeah, like I said, just aren't kind of getting it and need that extra push. Yeah, it's really interesting that you point out just how much learning goes in multiple directions um, and how important that is. That's that's really valuable. And, and one of the aspects of... Uh, you know, um, Anna, you were talking a little bit about, I don't know if you use these, the term information literacy, but you were talking about, you know, teaching your, stu your students to get into, to understand the scholarship and how to dive into it and what it takes to, to do that. And one of the uh, uh, lessons that gets learned there is you don't have, there's no one answer. There's no one textbook. There are multiple perspectives on so many uh, so many things and coming at, uh, and, and, you know, scholars are still lear are learning and trying to discover and just debate in much the same way that, um, Brie, you described uh, happening between your students um, uh, in, in this class. Um, I, I want to pivot a little bit. And, and Anna, I'm interested uh, in, so there are a few comments in the uh, Q&A, and I haven't had a chance to go in. So, Joe, if, if you could highlight ones that we, we should answer, I'd, I'd appreciate that. But one of the questions uh, has to be like, is around the, the cost of access. And I'm just wondering whether or not, I know you've done some pushing to make library licensed materials um, be used in courses uh, as course materials. So because there'd be zero textbook cost for the, for the students. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on the, the challenges, opportunities, the successes you, you, you've had there. Sure. So I don't have a great answer for the, the sort of technical question of gathering the usage data. I'm in, in user services. Um, but uh, we have, I think, hypothesis, um, using hypothesis with these library license resources really fits into other um, initiatives that we have going on. Um, we have a grant program where we try to get um, faculty to adopt or create open educational resources for their classes. Um, where we use Pressbooks, which also can be used with Hypothesis. Um, so there's already an introduction um, there. And then we also have a program um, that we call eCATS, which is ele electronic course assigned texts, where we're um, trying to identify texts that faculty are assigning and asking students to purchase that it turns out we have already licensed um, or can easily license. Um, and getting faculty to move to those. Um, sometimes that's just looked like I've just gone through every textbook that's in the bookstore for music, theater, and dance and looked to see if we have it and, and send emails to faculty to let them know that we have it or can get it. So it, I think this is just one, one tool in our toolkit to moving, um, to moving that direction and to moving our um, emphasis as a library to providing those things that we know are going to get use, um, that sort of just in just in time access instead of just in case access um, that we're having to move to when you know we have we have limited resources, the students have even more limited resources. Um, and so trying to really uh, make the most of of what we have. Uh, so thanks. I think that's a I, so many librarians are trying to do that. Oh, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think there actually were a couple of questions just from the audience in terms of what else is being annotated in the course in addition to JSTOR, which is it's a big part of a lot of course material. And so, um, I mean, you just mentioned press books, but I guess I'll turn it over to the group. What are some other things that you use Hypothesis for just so you can help people kind of get 
those wheels churn and about how this may impact their class. Well, I've been using it um, in both my on campus class um, as well as the on um, the virtual classes, the online classes. And, and in the online classes, I've used it with blogs. Uh, my students are, are particularly um, uh, energized by, uh, by blog, uh, talking about blog entries. Um, I've used it with videos, with YouTube videos. Um, and in my on-campus classes, I used it this semester kind of as a test to see how it would help strengthen um, in-class discussions about our content. And I think that in the fall, I'm going to actually make it a homework requirement. Um, I had the students um, annotate the chapter ahead of time so that I could track who was reading and who wasn't. And, um, and then I would use that those comments that they made in those annotations then to direct the conversation in class because I could look at, okay, what is what is the areas of interest that they have? Um, and then I would spend more time on that. Or if they posed a question, I would use that question then to uh, frame the discussion that we had. Um, so those are, those are some ways that I have used it and some of the other sources that I have used uh, for students to annotate. That's great, and there's a pretty it. robust... Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that the first thing I always use it for in the semester is the syllabus. I have them annotate the syllabus, mm -hmm. um, which I upload as a PDF, which lets them sort of practice the software and make sure they are able to access everything, um, but also lets me see what they're excited about or confused about make in the sure syllabus. Make sure they read their syllabus. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, make sure they read it and identify anything that they're anxious about or excited about. Um, and I've also used it for like professional websites. So like when I teach the ACRL framework for information literacy, I have them <laughs> annotate uh, that website. So um, pretty much any content I think <laughs> you can, I haven't tried it with audio content yet. I don't know if that works, but just about anything else. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to so echo, I, oh, sorry. I, I just wanted to echo that, you know, we, Yes, I used it in class, but there's as a, you know, person who likes to write and stuff, I've been seeing some applications that I could use it for outside of the classroom. One of the big things is I, I hate how Microsoft Word and, and Google, you put the comments in, right? And you go to the comments, you dissolve it, right? I would much rather upload whatever document I'm working on or website and you know post it send this out to my you know my peers or the people i'm asking for the opinion and them annotate you know whatever it is i send them rather than oh let's do this through microsoft or oh let's have a side chat over here so i'm not, as a student who's been exposed to this program i'm looking for applications to use it in my career or outside of the fashion which i find very interesting that's that's really great, Bri. And I know um, we just had a question in the Q&A. So there are a couple different ways you can annotate. You can make it so everyone in the course can see and you can take your own private notes. It sounds like you do a little bit of both. Uh, absolutely, I do, I do the private notes. I ought to do the, the public thing. And then uh, even, uh, even since I discovered students have access to this, I, I don't have the, the paid version, but I've been using the free version and I've been actually marking up some, you know, things that I've been personally working on using that, even though nobody else is going to see it. That's awesome. And so we had a few more questions uh, in the Q and A that um, there's one in specific, uh, when students freely annotate, are there patterns that you as faculty members notice and how they choose to annotate? I know when I was a student, they told me to comment on the first chapter, I'd pick the first paragraph and sort of call it a day. What do you see in your courses? I would say okay. one of the big, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Anna, go, ahead, go right ahead. Okay. Um, I was just going to say that I think one of the patterns I've seen the most often is, um, at least at first, the um, annotations are often affective, like they are focused on the parts of the article that, or the reading that give them an emotional 
response. Um, sometimes so we like read an article about the major music encyclopedia and its coverage of non-European <laughs> percussion instruments in, the, in history. And there's often a big reaction to, you know, the the racism in early versions of this of this encyclopedia and that kind of thing um, often sort of gets them into it. But um, as the semester goes on, I think I see a, an improvement in the sort of um, engagement with the scholarly argument um, and sort of pointing out uh, areas where they are confused. That seems to be the other the other trend is saying like, why would this why would they do this? Why would this be true? Um, what's the historical context that explains um, that's maybe assumed in the in the article that they aren't bringing to it? Um, so I'd say emotional response and confusion. <laughs> and as far as my students go, I have seen um, because I keep it more. Um, I don't put a lot of uh, requirements. Um, on the on what I expect, so I don't give them a list and say, okay, you need to have this, 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 and this included in it. Um, I find that they are more willing to engage um, and less hesitant because they're worried about missing one of those requirements. So I feel like by reducing the the framework um, of the expectations that they've actually been willing to engage more. Um, because I point out to them that a natural conversation does not include every single statement is um, media, um, includes all this detail that, that the, the interactions are, uh, include things of support, but also, uh, you know, comments that are uh, more, well, just, what they're what they're learning so it's okay for them to to say yes you make a great point this is something i didn't think about that's okay to add that as an annotation as long as they're also showing me what they're what they're gaining from it how it's applying how it relates to their lives um their daily lives things like that so um i give them that room to have the the shorter, more um, just uh, just general conversational tone type annotations, and I think because of that, they actually get more engaged. Um, because I believe that I gather those students who tend to hide in the backs of the classrooms in that last row, um, who depend on that one or two students to that usually are your talkers in classrooms. Those students who um, hide in the back row tend to be more engaged in this situation um, as opposed to in the classroom. So I feel like I gather those students and uh, encourage them and see more interaction from them. And I believe that part of that is due to just allowing them to take part in a conversation. Um, but that is my experience. Okay. That's and, great, um, and I think that directly answers Madeline's question about the equalization of voices and really raising up voices that we may not get heard in a classroom. So that's that's wonderful. All right, and um, I guess we'll do one more question um, from Wendy. Do you assign grades for annotations, or are these just part of the conversation? I assign I assign grades. Um, but it's more of a, um, as long as you're making an attempt. So it's almost like I use it in, if you were doing homework checks um, and making sure that students had read the content or you were giving a, like a quiz grade to see if they had read the materials. So I handle it more like that. So again, it's a low stakes, um, point-based, assignment so when the students in my experience is having taught for quarter of a century um i have found that students tend to respond better when they know that there are points to be earned but there's not a lot riding on the expectations 
in the sense of, okay, if I don't do X, Y, and Z, I'm not going to get these points. They'll actually engage more um, because they see it as they're being, they're earning the points, but they're not being harshly evaluated. So um, that's the way I do it. I handle it like a homework grade or a, a check-in, that type of a thing. Anna, yeah, how do you I handle it? Yeah, I have a very similar approach. I assign just a few points because we're doing often one or two readings a week with hypothesis. So it's just very low number of points. But what I also find with that is that in the past, if we, if a student didn't get around to doing the reading and it just, it happens, music students are extremely busy. If we talked about it in class and then we moved on, they would never read it and they would miss out on learning the content of that reading. Um, if there's a few points assigned to it and I let them do them late, they'll go back and read it still, at least kind of look at it and get a sense of, of what they missed. Um, and now I don't get, what do we do in class <laughs> when I miss class questions because they know what we did. The discussion is, is at least partially there. Um, I also saw there's a question about whether I adjust the readings um, because of that imposter syndrome or sort of um, different levels of students. And I haven't really adjusted the readings too much. I try to make them what I think is pretty accessible anyway, but um, at least within like musicology. <laughs> um, but I do, I have integrated more um, explicit instruction on reading academic articles and not necessarily reading every, having to read every word, but a sort of strategic approach to academic reading um, so that they can practice that in their annotations. Is great. And I know we are coming up on time. So Lee, Anna, Bry, thank you so much for sharing all your experiences uh, using Hypothesis and JSTOR in the classroom. And it sounds like, you know, it's really opened up a new set of possibilities in terms of how you're engaging with the students. I also love that the two courses that you're all focused on and your disciplines are so different. I mean, when I thought of annotation up front, it was English class. It makes so much sense, but you can really use this type of application anywhere that your students are learning. And I know there are a few questions we weren't able to get to. And so um, we are gonna be sending a copy of this recording to everyone that attended and for those of you who weren't able to make it. And uh, we can send some follow-up information uh, about both Hypothesis and JSTOR if you don't subscribe to one or both of those. Uh, on the Hypothesis side, there's a lot more that you can do than just annotate um, a few simple articles. I think it starts really basic and we can hear how in-depth it gets, but no one starts that way. It's really figuring out what are those first assignments and how are you gonna integrate it? And one of the things that I'm most proud of of the team here at Hypothesis is we have a really great team that helps schools, faculty, and instructional designers and librarians figure out how to incorporate social annotation into the things that they're already doing. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's just maybe greasing that a little bit more so you can get more out of the wheel you're already using. And so we offer things like partner workshops uh, that focus on how to use our tool in your specific LMS. We support Canvas, as you saw today, but also Blackboard, D2L, Moodle, and Sakai. And then we do offer customized faculty trainings for subscribers. Uh, we will send out a copy of this deck after. You can see our faculty panel discussion. It's a video podcast, Liquid Margins. We've got starter assignments for social annotation and an educator forum that is faculty who chat in a Slack channel about different ways that they share things. Not much different than the chat here today. Uh, we also do have Hypothesis Academy for subscribers. That is professional development credit, a two-week asynchronous course that starts with the basics of social annotation and really gets you up and running, especially as you're preparing for the next semester. Uh, we do have a kickstart promotion as we think about going back to school. It's crazy to think the academic year flips in uh, six weeks or so. Uh, so we do have a great pricing promotion for non-subscribers. Um, we will be sending some information about that to everyone after the call. And if you are not a JSTOR subscriber, and I think that number is few and far between here in the US anyway, you definitely wanna get this. There's so many different resources. It's thousands of different journal articles, millions of different pieces actually. And they have a really amazing uh, commitment to a path to open with some new fee models. So definitely wanna check that out as well. But uh, as we come right up to time, I wanna say thank you to everyone. Alex, Anna, Lee, Bry, it's great to see you all again today. And um, thanks for everybody for attending. Uh, make it a great week and happy early Memorial Day.
All right, awesome. Thanks, Joe. And just want to reiterate uh, the point about the recording. Um, just a reminder, we do record all of our webinars. So if you missed any part of today's presentation, you can go back and watch the recording. You can share it with a colleague that wasn't able to attend today. Uh, the recordings are usually ready to watch a few hours after the live broadcast. Um, use the same link you used today. We're also going to send you a reminder email tomorrow with the link to watch. So uh, thanks again, everybody, and we'll see you next time.